O congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said one to another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, This is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray the psalm responsively by the whole verse. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, and speak of all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength. Continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done, his wonders and his judgments of mouth. He led out his people with silver and gold. In all their tribes, there was not one that stumbled. He spread out a cloud for a covering and a fire to give light in the night season. He opened the rock and water flowed, so the river ran in the dry places. So he led forth his people with gladness, his chosen with shouts of joy. That they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Alleluia. The New Testament lesson this morning is from Paul's epistle to the Philippians. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. 
The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and about three o'clock, he did the same. At about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Almighty God, I ask that we would hear your word and walk in love through your spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So, um, I have a sermon all written out, but some things happened this week that made me think that I think it's time for more of a family chat rather than a sermon today. So, we're going to be going off of some notes that I've taken on my phone, things that I would like to talk about. Um, 
So two weeks ago, there was clergy conference. That is a time when all of the priests and deacons and the diocese get together, meet with the bishop, have a couple of days of prayer and discussion and stuff like that. At that meeting, the bishop said that he would like all congregations to return to using a common cup. Um, and his preference for that was for people to drink from the cup rather than in tinct. I brought this up with the vestry on Tuesday evening, saying that I thought maybe we should implement this on uh, All Saints Day, the first weekend in November. Uh, there was some pushback to that, uh, also some questions about it. So I have contacted the bishop to ask whether or not intinction would still be allowed, uh, to ask if we're still gonna have the little red drops on the wafers, things like that. I haven't heard back yet. I'm guessing that he's gonna be talking about that at our next clergy call, which is about two weeks from now. Um, regarding that, uh, I know there's some concerns and fears. Uh, by Thursday morning, I was hearing from parishioners that people were worried about this change, so I thought, I better talk about it. Um, we have some printouts in the gathering space regarding like infection control and stuff like that. Uh, the fact is drinking from the common cup when done properly is far safer infection wise uh, than dipping uh, your bread in tincting. So with the cup being silver, a precious metal, and with the alcohol and its antiseptic properties, those things already uh, make it difficult for viruses and bacteria to, to live in that element. Um, and then when wiped with a clean cloth or clean portion of a cloth, the section that somebody's mouth has just touched is actually, it's, it's like an infinitesimally small chance of transmitting anything whatsoever. Um, so you can feel safe about it. Historically, this is how the church has, has drank communion when they've had the cup. Um, how else do I do this? The, uh, yeah, no deacons or priests when they finish the cup at the end of the service have ever been recorded as becoming ill or, or getting disease from it, things like that. So this is what we're expecting to have happen. If you have more questions, let me know. Um, I, the idea that the bishop is wanting to promote is the unity of the body of Christ. So I grew up Baptist and we had the individual little shot glasses with grape juice in what basically looked sort of like a hubcap and we'd pass those around and be very individual about it all. Um, we would take it all at the same time, but it was very much a centralized me thing. Uh, in the Episcopal church, we want to emphasize more the unity of the entirety of the body, not just a me and Jesus kind of thing, which is fine, but also me and Wayne, and me and Jose, and me and Anne, and me and Bob, um, that kind of a unity. So using the common cup is, is one of the ways that we show that. Um, when I, well, I, I moved from Baptist into a liturgical church, um, didn't really think anything about the change of using the common cup until I was in seminary. And then uh, at Easter, I went to this citywide Good Friday service that was being held in like the basketball stadium at the University of Texas. And at the door, when we walked in, they gave us these little individual cups that had a little wafer sealed on the top. Um, that was new to me. I hadn't seen the little wafer sealed in before. Um, and we're gonna all have communion together. And when the time came for that, it was chaos. It was raw chaos. Nobody knew when to drink, nobody knew what to eat, nobody knew how to do stuff. Ended up with cups and things all over the floor of the stadium. It was really gross, <laughs> literally, physically. Um, but there was this aspect to it that that was what really showed me that difference between my individualism and my being a part of a body and connected with one another. So that was kind of a thing that convinced me in that direction. Uh, again, I do have questions out to the bishop. We'll find out more hopefully in the coming weeks. Um, but I think that part of the frustrations or fears about this change has to do with a misunderstanding of how the church functions, works, and is structured. 
So we frequently think of power in terms of how like government works or a company or something. You have the president or the CEO at the top and then the next layer of important people and then the next layer of important people and the next layer. And then down at the bottom, there's all the little people who do all the work but are just being told what to do and they don't really have any voice in it. So that is how power works in the world. In the church, it is supposed to be opposite of that. So you could think of it as an inverted pyramid with the bishop at the bottom, then a layer with priests and deacons, and then the congregations, the laity of the church. Another good way to think about it would be like a tree. So think of the bishop as a trunk. He's connected to the roots, the histories, the traditions, the scriptures uh, of the church. He's connected with other trunks nearby, with the other bishops, things like that. The bishop is meant to be there to bring unity unity within the many churches that then grow out of the diocese. So bishop is a trunk, then you have deacons and priests. Uh, and think of us as like branches out of that tree. So we're connected with the bishop more regularly than the congregations are. And we're connected with the local communities where things are reaching out, how things are growing, different places like that. Um, we actually have some limitations <laughs> on what we can do. Uh, we had some people who were saying like, I'm not gonna do what the bishop tells me to do. Nobody can tell me to what to do. And that's actually accurate. Um, nobody can tell you what to do as the congregations, <laughs> but the bishop can tell me what to do uh, because of the way ordination works. And the bishop can tell Phil what to do. So uh, say the bishop wanted Phil to be over at La Union next week. Phil has to go over there. Deacons, deacons are, the way they described it back in my previous diocese is, deacons are the hands of the bishop. Deacons are meant to go out into the congregations, both to raise up and encourage service from the congregation within the community, but also sometimes to bring trouble. So if there is a congregation that's kind of complacent about something, the bishop can send a deacon there specifically to get them moving again so that they'll be, become active in their community, that they'll start reaching out again. My job as a priest is to support the congregation. So sometimes actually bishops, or not bishops, but deacons and priests end up at odds with one another where the, pre, the deacon is trying to get stuff stirred up and the priest is trying to make sure that nobody gets too stirred up. <laughs> it gets complicated and weird, but it does happen. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. Um, then the final layer in that tree, you have the bishop as the trunk, the priests and deacons as the branches. The final layer is the leaves and the fruit and things like that. And that is the, the congregants. That is the individual Christians, the laity, who are able to get out and spread into the world in ways that I as a priest can't, in ways that the bishop never would be able to. That's where the created creativity and the joy and the fun of the church actually come from. Where, say, Virginia sees something that she's interested in and she wants to start, a, she's, she wants to try starting a particular ministry to a particular group. My job is to say, okay, how can we help you with that? How can we make that happen? It's not my job to do it for her, but it is my job to help with that. So when we have different people coming from different parts of the congregation, with different viewpoints, different connections to different parts of the community, when they come with an idea of how to serve that part of the community, I do my best to say yes and say, okay, how can we figure this out? How can we do this together? How can we support you in that? Um, so that's basically the structure. Sorry, I got my notes on my phone. Yeah, the bishop is really meant to be the source of the unity of the church and what's going on there. Um, so within that structure then, uh, sometimes there are problems. And this week, I found out about uh, something that has finally actually shown its head going on within the congregation. So rumors happen in congregations, rumblings happen all the time, it's human nature. Most of the time, I hear about them, but I don't put any weight into them. This one actually has begun to bear fruit, so I want to address it. 
uh, I have found out that there are certain people in the congregation who are actively decruiting people from various mysteries, ministries in the church. Um, going in, telling other people, oh, don't do this, don't do that. Um, we'll, make John, we'll make Father Jonathan look bad, seems to be sort of the idea there. Um, even though I'm not involved in that ministry and it would just be that group actually didn't do the service that they normally do. Um, that is wrong. I shouldn't have to say that, but that's wrong. And so I do need to address that as an issue within the church. Uh, there were a few reasons that I was given for that. Um, one is that Father Jonathan thinks he's better than everybody else. That's not true. Um, actually, most of the people in the congregation are really super interesting once, once I get to know them, uh, which is great. Uh, the truth is that Father Jonathan has treatment-resistant major depressive disorder. Uh, I, it's well-managed overall, but with that diagnosis, with that disability, comes often social anxiety, severe social anxiety. So sometimes I have to choose where I'm going to put my energy. So after the first service, I often have to go back to my office to kind of recharge and then prepare for this service. After this service, I often have to choose whether or not I'm going to talk to people for five or 10 minutes um, or spend any time with my wife the rest of the day because I will fall asleep for three or four hours when I get home. It is her, one of her two days off. I want to spend time with my wife. So I do what I can to come out. Um, I'm going to try harder, just be a little more visible. But it's not that I think I'm better than you. I'm actually kind of having to take care of a medical condition uh, in that. Uh, the second thing that I heard about was um, that I am too woke. Um, which woke is just this nebulous word that doesn't actually mean anything other than I don't like what you like anymore. Um, so I will tell you, my politics regarding the church, my, my, my position regarding politics in the church, I have two things. One, love your neighbor as yourself. Two, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Those are my political positions regarding the church. So when I do a sermon, I go through it. I spend hours, literally hours, going through line by line, reviewing what I've written, what I've said, how I've said it. I think of specific individuals in the congregation that I know come from a very different political or social viewpoint than I do. And I go through and, and I think, oh, wait, that phrase, the way it's phrased, probably would make it so that so-and-so over here wouldn't be able to hear what's going on with the rest of the sermon. They would miss the main point. Okay, how do I change that? I go to another section and think of another person. Like, oh, you know what? That's really going to hit this button with them. I need to be able to figure out how to do that. Sometimes it gets so far that I have to cut out whole sections of my sermons because there's no way to phrase them without causing offense to different people. Um, my job is not, my, my desire is not to force people into any poli particular political position or social position or anything like that. That's not my job. My job is to preach the gospel. Now, when politics and social issues encroach on the gospel, which they do a lot now because it's really hard to separate any of this anymore. When that happens, I am going to address the things that have to do with the gospel. So those things would be loving your neighbor and not taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. So if you've noticed, often when I do mention political things specifically, it is because whatever that person or group or whatever is doing is they are claiming God is on their side. And that is what the third commandment is about. It's not about swearing. It's not about accidentally using a cuss word or something like that. The third commandment is, in modern language, essentially, don't put God's name on your cause. So politicians do this all the time, constantly. They tell you, well, if you're a Christian, you have to do this and vote this way because God said blah, blah, blah. 
I will sometimes address those things from the pulpit and say, no, God did not say this. There's an openness. There's an ability for us to disagree. And that actually is one of the beauties of the Episcopal Church and really the gift the Anglican Communion brings to the entirety of the worldwide church is the allowance and ability to disagree. You can sit right beside somebody who has completely different political leanings than you, completely different social concepts than you, and you can still worship Jesus with them. You can go out and serve the community with that person without agreeing with everything that they think about. Likewise, if you don't feel comfortable with certain things that other people in the congregation are doing, certain ministries that we're developing, it's okay not to participate. And I don't want anybody to feel bad like, oh, you know, everybody's going to look down on me because I don't want to do that. That's not, that's not the point of the church. The point of the church is, and the point of me as a priest, is to support the different groups. So like with the upcoming Pride events, somebody came, they said they had this idea. Great, let's see how, let's see how that might go and develop. If there was some, I don't know, conservative cause, say like there's a veterans fundraiser or something like that, if somebody comes to me with that idea and is willing to work on it and say, yes, let's do that. Let's support that cause. My job is not to tell you how to think. My job is not to tell you who to vote for, what to vote for, how to vote. My job is to help us reach out into the community. Now, part of that, let me get back to my notes and see what's going on here. Yeah. Um, start with an example, well, continue with an example. This week I had somebody who's been visiting the congregation on and off come and meet me at my office. And they um, claim to be more progressive on a lot of social issues, but they are not so progressive when it comes to the concept of trans individuals. And that person wanted to know whether or not they could come to this church because they're different. What I told them was, can you be kind? Can you sit beside this person that may or may not be there um, and worship Christ? Can you allow them to serve God in the way that they feel called to do? Can you serve God in the way you feel called to do without causing disruption and division and trying to like recruit people to different kinds of causes, things like that? If so, if you can be kind, please join our congregation. I don't need you to think exactly like me. I don't need you to think like anybody else in the room. You know, Wayne is Wayne. Wayne has his own experiences in life. Wayne is going to think that what Wayne thinks. Marvin is Marvin. He has his experiences. Again, going to think what he thinks. Um, let's see, looking around. Jeff and Sue, also different individuals. And we, as Christians and Episcopalians, can still work together, even though we might not agree on these detailed things with one another. The important aspect of the Episcopal Church is how do we worship as one and how do we serve our communities? So if we're doing something, if part of the congregation is doing something and you don't feel comfortable being involved with it, fine, don't be involved with it. It's not a judgment thing. If a different part of the congregation is doing something and maybe you do support that, okay, great, join in. Work, do the work, do the work together. Be the body of Christ. And that really is kind of what it all boils down to. And if you look at our gospel text today, this is a pretty famous parable. Um, one thing we don't see in the reading today is that immediately before this, Jesus also says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Then he says the word for, and then he tells the parable. So this is framed in the concept of first, last, last, first. The point of the parable isn't necessarily that like the landowners jipping the people who worked all day long or stuff like that. You know, the landowner went out, 
these people were available at a certain time in the morning. He's like, hey, I'll hire you for this wage. They're like, awesome, okay, let's go work. Goes back out later, there's some more people standing around. He's like, hey, you want to come work? I'll pay you something. They're like, okay, well, that sounds good. Comes back at the end of the day, and then there's this group of people that it's not necessarily that they were lazy, like they slept in, they'd been partying all night or something like that. These people haven't been hired. That word idle doesn't actually exist in the text. It's simply these people have not been hired. And in that culture, most likely what that meant was somebody had a disability or the community was kind of shunning that person, something like that. Well, the, the landowner comes out and says, hey, you know what? You haven't been working. Why don't you come join me? So he brings them into that vineyard to work together. Then at the end of the day, when he chooses what he's going to do when he's paying people, it's not some sort of like communist thing going on with him. It's a generosity thing. It's the idea that this day's wage can help feed a family for like three or four days. The landowner has the money to be able to give. So the landowner gives to the people who weren't allowed to work or couldn't work, um, chooses to give enough to take care of their families because the landowner loves those people and his community and those families. And so down the line. And you had the people who worked hard at the beginning of the day receiving the same as the other because the homeowner is being really generous, really, really kind. He's not getting the work out of these people that he got from these, but these people worked hard and they're, it's a dignified thing to do. The problem that's going on in the parable has nothing to do with the landowner or really even kind of the working or the inequality of pay. The problem that's going on in the parable is that at the end, the people who had been there all day think that they are better than the other people. They, the way they phrase things, the way they talk about things, they're saying, you're treating us like them? So think of who they are. Think of who that person or group or whatever is in your life. God wants to treat them equally. God loves them and cares for them. God cares for their families. God is going to work to help provide for them. Just like God is going to work to help provide for those who are already more able to do stuff. And that is really the point of the church is that unity, that working together. We look at life as a sort of a competition where it's all a game where like, I have to get enough points to win or um, you know, maybe it's a video game and you have to kill enough bad guys in order to be promoted to the next level, something like that, and you want to do it before your friends do so that you can get the special gun. Uh, maybe it's a board game and you just want to get to the end first. We think of life like that, but that is not the way God's kingdom works. God's kingdom is not competitive. Nobody gets ahead, nobody gets behind, nobody gets left. God's kingdom is more like a cooperative game. The idea of the first will be last and the last will be first isn't just like this inversion of reality or what happens in normal everyday life. That idea is that everybody crosses the line together. Nobody wins the game of life until everybody wins at this game of life. So really what Jesus is calling us to do here is to be open to one another, to serve one another, to be willing to, you know, if you're able to put in some extra work, awesome, great, fantastic, thank you so much. If you're not able to do as much, do what you can. That's awesome. God still loves you either way. And that is what we as a church should be about. So if somebody comes and they're like, hey, you shouldn't be involved in such and such a ministry, consider what that's actually doing. That's not harming me. That's harming the people that you were serving, which makes no sense whatsoever. That's your friends and that's your family. If you have problems with what I say or do, come to me and talk to me. I'm not scary. I genuinely am not. Um, I might not be able to talk to you after the service because my brain is kind of fried. I'll do my best to improve on that, um, but sometimes I just can't. So these are the things that really I feel like we need to address today. First, the communion thing. You know, 
If you want to drink from the cup, fine. If you want to intinct, technically, nobody up here can stop you. You can do what you want. You are not bound to orders from the bishop like us. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to keep the drop of wine on the wafers. I don't know. That's still up in the air. Uh, the point is to participate, to come together, to be one body. And just because somebody has something to drink and somebody has something to eat doesn't mean that you're not part of the body. You know, like there, if somebody uh, is gluten intolerant and they can't have the bread, they could still have the wine, provided that people haven't been dipping gluten in it. Um, if somebody is alcoholic, it's perfectly fine to just take the bread. We're not forcing you to do one or the other. We're not forcing you to do both. For hundreds of years, hundreds of years, the congregations only had the bread. It's, it's not a bad thing. So if you are afraid of a common cup, you don't want to use it, that's okay. If you decide you're going to dip your bread in there anyway, I can't stop you. The point is we come together to serve one another, to join with one another, to say, hey, I'm part of your body, Wayne. I'm part of yours. I'm part of yours. I'm part of yours. I'm part of yours. We are in this together, and we will serve God and worship God together. All right, thank you. The rubrics don't allow me to say hallelujah after the dismissal. Y'all can do what you want. Enough said. <laughs> Let's stand together and reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. <clears throat> we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are found on page 9 of your bulletin. Gather us together, O God, that we may share the prayers, intentions, and thanksgiving of our community. We are generous with our gifts. I ask your prayers for the church, for all who worship God this day, for our clergy, our diocesan leaders, and for our congregation. We pray especially for this season in which we celebrate our stories of leadership and our support for mission. We are generous with our gifts of leadership. I ask your prayers for our nation and all nations, for refugees fleeing climate change and war, for conflicts of resources and land, 
for lawmakers, peacekeepers, and informed citizens. We pray for a distribution of wealth that helps the poor and the marginalized. We are generous with our gifts of peace. I ask your prayers for the sick, the lonely, the lost, and those who grieve. We remember especially those on our prayer, parish prayer list, Becky, Allison, Linda and Frank, the family of Bill Richardson, Henry, Auburn, Tiran, Malik, Mark, Michelle, Al, Minnie, Justin, Bert and family, Carolyn, Elsie, Judy, Marvin, Joe, Mary, Joe, Weldon, Wayne, Lee, Carmen, Beverly, Sarah, Colin, Phoenix, Eric and Eden, Joyce, Anthony, Nathaniel, Oliver, Jeff, Chuck, and those we name now in silence or aloud. We are generous with our gifts of healing. I ask your prayers for those who have died, those who are dying, and those who mourn. For those on our parish prayer list, Dana Markham, Ryan Peavy, Cordy Smith, Tom Galligan, Bill Detmer, Jeremy Warren Johnson, Lee Smith, David Johnson, and for those we name now in silence or aloud. We are generous with our gifts of support. I ask your remembrance of thanksgivings and blessings, for we are given time, talent, and treasure to share with the world. We are generous with our gratitude. May we, who are blessed by so much wealth and wisdom, share our works with a world in need. Amen. Taking a moment for reflection, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now, the peace of the Lord be always with you.
Um, one other reason that I write down my sermons is so that they don't go on for 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, 10 is my normal limit. Today was a bit long. I apologize for that, but I felt like we really did need to talk about some of these things. <laughs> um, with this week's announcements, of course, we have the colored sheet. This is a kind of salmon pink this week, has everything that's going on now or soon. Um, a couple things to point out. Um, we have our final BAP perception slash Episcopal 101 class today after the service in the parish hall, I'm hoping that's around 12 o'clock. Again, I went a little bit long. We'll get there as close, close and fast as we can. Another thing is that tonight, this afternoon, at 4 o'clock, there is a special free concert uh, with a choir where people have flown in from various places in the country and practiced together all week, a group called Bella Voce. And they are giving a free choir, a free uh, concert performance here in the sanctuary, uh, kind of in gratitude for us allowing them to use our space for rehearsals throughout this week. Uh, I've heard it's really, really beautiful. I am not sure if I'm going to be able to be there um, because I'm headed out on vacation next week. I'll be gone for one and a half, two weeks. Uh, and I will likely be somewhere down in Vado trying to get goats out of the back of a minivan. So I <laughs> will... We'll do our best. Uh, if I can be here, though, I've heard it's really great, and I really do hope that I can. Um, speaking more of animals, October 8th, so two weeks from today, we're having a combined service at 10 o'clock out in the parking lot. We are celebrating St. Francis Day and the blessing of the animals. So please feel free to bring any of your pets all of your pets, provided they are safe, um, to come and we will do prayers and blessings for them. We will celebrate God's love for the entirety of creation and our love for these animals um, it, that, that do bring so much to our lives. Uh, as I did mention, if your pet is not necessarily safe to be around other pets or people, um, please bring, say, maybe a collar or their food bowl, or a photo, or something like that where they can be blessed. You know, the goats would probably be safe around others. I don't know how excited they'd be around dogs. One of our dogs would be very unsafe with other dogs. Great with the people, but other dogs would be in deep danger. So uh, if there's a dangerous animal, <laughs> you still love them, <laughs> it's okay to bring something to be, to be blessed in their absence. All right, a couple other things. Uh, the shoebox ministry, they've been advertising it in the leaflet for a couple of weeks. Um, they definitely need some more donations. Uh, also, if when you came in, you probably did see the giant box or pile of shoeboxes out in the uh, gathering space. They need help wrapping all of those. So if you could take anywhere from one to 15 of those home with you and get those all wrapped up and bring them back to the office, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, other things, um, save the dates, upcoming things. We do have, um, the Pride Eucharist on October 6th where we're inviting in the, um, local LGBTQIA plus community, uh, to worship and appreciate God's true love for everyone. Uh, October 7th, we have the, uh, Pride booth with St. James, um, down at the event on Main Street. Uh, I believe there's probably still some slots open if people would like to come and pray with people or just be kind. Um, there's a, a kind of a poster board in the gathering space that has the sign-up sheet information there. Uh, at the end of October, one of our parishioners had volunteered to arrange a men's retreat. So that is going to be happening at the Holy Cross Retreat Center down past Messia Park on October 28th at, um, from 8.30 till 3.30 in the afternoon. Space is limited. It does cost 20 or $25. I think the information's all in here uh, to attend, but scholarships are available if that amount of money would be a problem for you. Also, that evening then, we are having trunk or treat. If you're not familiar with that idea, rather than having little kids go out into sketchy neighborhoods and knowing who knows what happens as they go and get their candy, um, we invite people to come to our parking lot where we have cars lined up and decorated. It's a nice, safe place, a lot of fun for the kids to come along. I'm sure there's still a space available to join in with that as well. All right, tents to rents.
Just want to say a huge thank you to St. Andrews for Tents to Rinse. We're, we're officially over, but still accepting gifts. Um, but we're over $95,000, and um, I think we'll make it over $100,000 before it's done. Yes, hooray, hallelujah. Um, we had a lot of exciting new things happen this year, and it's great to see the entire community uh, rally around. I've had the opportunity to talk to literally 100 people that I had never met before about um, the experience of homelessness, and not one person was, you know, oh, those people are lazy or whatever. You know, everyone, I think people are really recognizing what this experience is really all about and how we have to solve it one person at a time. And so St. Andrew's being part and such an important part of dealing with the experience of homelessness and poverty in Las Cruces. Um, yeah, way to go, guys. You're so amazing. I love you so much. second Sunday supper, so another thing to get ready for. Okay, I think I hit all of the major stuff. Again, do take a look at the sheet. Um, ah, here we go. Also, there was that email survey a few weeks ago. Uh, the communications group has compiled that information, these sheets, handouts, uh, kind of three, three pages of information. Uh, those are available out in the gathering space as well if you'd like to take a look at that. All right. Normal weekly events, Tuesday morning we have morning prayer at 9.30 over in the chapel led by Deacon Ann. Wednesday morning is the women's breakfast at 9 o'clock up at Sunset Grill. Thursday morning is the men's breakfast at 8 o'clock just up the street at Bite of Belgium. Um, and even though I'm going to be out of town, Mother Jeannie will be leading the noon service on Thursday uh, in Kendrick Chapel. She'll also be presiding and preaching and everything next weekend. Um, so th special thanks to her for <laughs> allowing me to take a little bit of a break. All right. Do we have anyone who would wish to have a blessing for a birthday or anniversary? All right. Since John is still up there, I'm assuming that it's a birthday? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. If you'd like to join us in the prayer for blessings of birthdays, uh, please turn in your red book, the Book of Common Prayer, to page 830. Page 830, prayer number 51 for a birthday. And you can use you and your rather than thy and thou if you want. <laughs> Watch over your child, O Lord, as her days increase. Bless and guide her wherever she may be. Strengthen her when she stands. Comfort her when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise her up if she falls. And in her heart, may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday, Judy. We continue our service with the offertory. So please offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good your vows to the Most High. Joy. 
make earlier, I'm sure uh, Corey would make himself. Uh, if you're interested in joining the choir, there's always more space. Um, also, we do need some help with sound at this service, so if you could contact the office since I'm going to be gone, and uh, if you're interested in helping with that, that would be fantastic too. Thank you. And now the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. 
My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed, says the Lord. My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed, says the Lord. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood dwell in me, and I in them. My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed, says the Lord. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
You'll notice on page 17 that we have a little bit of a different post-communion prayer. Uh, This is for our stewardship season. Let us pray. God of abundance and grace, by the provision of this feast, the sacrament of our Savior, Jesus Christ, you have united us together in purpose and place. May we who have gathered and broken bread now share the living word, being rooted in abundance, serving you with joy and steadfast faith through Jesus Christ, our head. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs>